One hour. Yeah. This one? This one? No, this one. So this one. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's, uh, it's my pleasure and my honor to be introducing Sheikh Tamar Daghidi, a uh, dear friend and teacher of mine. I've had the pleasure of knowing Sheikh Tamar for the last couple of years. And uh, from the very beginning, I, I recognize the deep depth of knowledge, knowledge that um, is not just book knowledge and studied academic knowledge, but knowledge that's based in experience. And uh, I won't say too much, but uh, Sheikh Tamar is trained as a medical doctor and has lived uh, throughout the world, including extensively in the West. So he's very familiar with the situation out here for us, for people living here in the West. Uh, he's very familiar with that, trained, as I said, as a medical doctor. So also, you know, he's a scientist. And yet uh, he found early in his life a deep calling for a deeper dimension of religion, of spirituality. And so he sought out great teachers of classical knowledge, uh, teachers of traditional knowledge. Again, uh, teachers that had not just academic knowledge, but also experiential knowledge. And uh, from what I know of Sheikh Tamar, he's made it his life mission to find and seek out the people that are carrying that classical spiritual knowledge that was passed to the Ummah from the Prophet Sallallahu and he's uh, made a great effort to travel throughout the world to seek out these men of knowledge. So um, again, I don't want to be too long. I could probably go on for a little bit, but um, I'll just say that uh, such people um, are doorways to understanding and uh, light. And uh, Alhamdulillah, from what I have seen, Dr. Tamer, Sheikh Tamer, is, is carrying in addition to an extensive amount of practical knowledge, also a deep understanding and wisdom and we hope, inshallah, thank you all for coming. Inshallah, we hope to uh, benefit from his knowledge. And the Jazakallah khairan wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa afdalu salati wa akmalu taslim. Ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Mawlana Muhammad al-Nabiyya al-Ameen. Wa ala alihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin. وأصحابه الغر الميامين وعلينا وعلى السامعين معهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم بك لا بنفسي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and thank you for uh, uh, having me here Alhamdulillah, for bringing us together uh, in this blessed house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, thanks to the host, to my respected brother Ihsan for this introduction, which I know I, uh, I fall short of most of the words that were spoken. And I'm sure everyone knows himself more than uh, the outside world. Um, the reason that brings us to speak uh, is not really the lack of speakers. The Muslim world, mashallah, today has got a lot of speakers. Most of them are very uh, skilled, qualified, trained, and educated. Um, and when one looks at uh, one's limited um, abilities, 
you find that there is not much we can add to these people, really, in terms of their efforts. Uh, but I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables me uh, to deliver is a word or a sentence that opens the minds and hearts of the people that are listening to this. Even if it's one man or one woman, uh, that would be worth while this gathering and it will stay um, in our balances for many, many, many years to come as we live here and for eternity as we depart. With this in mind, um, and picking on what uh, my respected brother Hassan started with, and traveling and seeing Muslims and seeing non-Muslims and seeing the state of affairs for humanity right now, one feels uh, the necessity to, to speak differently. What I mean by differently is to speak the language that you and I speak every day, not in the mosque, but outside of the mosque. There is a gap and that gap is getting bigger and bigger between um, our lives as Muslims, uh, as uh, people who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and want to serve Him, and the outside world that's changing. And I can see that we are racing, we are racing as Muslims because of the good intentions that we have to try to bridge that gap, especially when it comes now to our children and to grandchildren. The feeling is you have to do a little bit more and more to try to keep the little faith that we have. So lots of activities being organized almost on, a, on, a, on an hourly basis around the world, uh, different activities of dawah, talks, lectures, seminars, and um, in this ocean of uh, information that we live in, I hope that uh, we can put a drop uh, that captures your attention. So with that, I'd like us to uh, bring into our gathering now, into the room, the blessings of mentioning the name of uh, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As when his name is mentioned by a, uh, a man or a woman who knows him, um, the mercy descends and covers the whole gathering. This is very important. It is not the amount of remembrance you make. It is not how many times you flick your tasbih. Are you there or are you in the telephone? This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa When his name is mentioned, this requires utmost respect, absolute attention, absolute attention. and complete presence. For as much as you are present, you will get. And as much as you are absent, you will not get. An incident that I'm sure most of you are aware of took place towards the end of the life of our beloved Prophet wasallam in what is known to be Hadith Jibreel in the books of Hadith and there are lots of people here I'm sure that are more knowledgeable uh, than me the Hadith has several riwayat more than ten three of which are very solid and they come 
in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. And without technically analyzing the hadith, we'd like to see how that applies to our lives. Because my brothers and sisters, Sunnah is not to blindly copy the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sunnah is to live the life of the Prophet in, your, in the course of your life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you may be working in a place where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not work or doing a job he didn't do. Now, having the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as your leader, as your role model, manifest himself in you as you go to that job or school or home is indeed the sunnah. So the sunnah, the definition we like to use for the sunnah is the manifestation of the Prophet wasallam in the practitioner's life. The manifestation means how he was not how he looked. The look comes at the end. The look comes at the end because, as you know, if somebody looks something he's not, he becomes fake. And that is a very dangerous path. So we pay attention to this incident and we try to understand that journey described in it and how does it pertain to our lives today, everyday lives. The Prophet is sitting with his companions and we will narrate it in a collective, comprehensive manner, not in a literal manner, for the literalism are available in the books for you to go back to and read. But the Prophet is sitting with his companions and now we're talking about Medina, we're talking towards the end of his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Most of the Qur'an have been already revealed the Sharia is complete, the Muslims are fasting, the Muslims are um, giving the zakah, they pray five times a day. So a situation similar to what we have today in terms of the perfection or the completion of Sharia or the law. And in the narration by Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, he says, فَطَلَعَ عَلَيْنَا رَجُلُ a man appeared and that man was dressed in white, so white and his hair was so dark black. But he says we couldn't see that he was coming from a journey or a travel when we didn't know who he is because in those days everybody knew everyone and so they would know how to welcome a guest when they come. They had traveling guests, for example, would get three days stay at the Muslims' homes without questions asked, not without, with hospitality. It goes without saying, hospitality will be extended. But there are three days with no questions to ask the guest as the guest arrives. They looked at this traveler whom they didn't recognize and then he went straight to the Prophet ﷺ, sat in front of him and put his knees, touching the knees of the Prophet ﷺ. And then in some narrations, he put his hands on the thighs of the Prophet ﷺ. And he started the questions that you may be familiar with. He asked the Prophet ﷺ four questions, not three. The first was about the definition of Islam. This is in Umar ibn Khattab, in the riwayah of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. In the riwayah of Abu Huraira, the first one is about Iman, and the second one is Islam. In Umar ibn Khattab's riwayah radiallahu anhu, it is Islam, then Iman, then Ihsan, then the last age. He asked about the last age, the, the hour. And every time he asked the question, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answers, the question and he says to him correct and the Sahaba are saying we are extremely um, 
surprised. He's asking him and he's confirming his answers. And at the end of the discourse, the man leaves. The Prophet ﷺ discloses the nature of that man. And he says, that was Jibreel and he had come to teach you your religion. Remember, he asked about four things. Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and the last age. Yani learning about Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and the last age is religion. According to the Prophet Sallallahu Every word he says is measured. So technically if we're teaching religion to our children, we should be teaching these four. Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and the last age, which we live through right now. And most of us are struggling with it. Now, before we, we journey through these, what I call the three mountains of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, in the next uh, few minutes, inshallah, that Allah uh, would allow us to talk about, I'd like to draw your attention to a very important point. The sequence of the questions, Islam, Iman, Ihsan, Iman, Islam, Ihsan, and then the last age, sounds a little bit not matching the sequence. So it could be Islam, Iman, Ihsan, let's say, and Yaqeen, or, but we've gone into the last age. Is there any message for us to understand here? And then what kind of questioning that leads to the person who poses the questions, confirming the answers? The answer to that is that these are revision questions. So now let's remove the veils and understand the scene a little bit more. The Prophet wasallam the divinely inspired teacher is sitting with his students. And then the Prophet Sallallahu teacher enters the room. This is the only incidence where the students and the teacher and the teacher's teacher are in one place. What is the Prophet Sallallahu trying to show us here? What message is he sending to us? He's sending to us a message that this deen, this religion, is to be conveyed in that form. Not by someone sitting, picking a book, reading by himself, understanding by himself, deciding by himself and judging by himself. For that person only arrives at the end of his knowledge quest at himself. The process of transfer of knowledge is all about getting out of one's self and surrendering to superior knowledge that is coming to you. And the Prophet ﷺ is showing us that process live with the companions and the teacher. But it has a very important message for us. You have to remember that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was not a lot of need for miracles because the Prophet ﷺ, the ultimate miracle was there amongst them. But in our time, in times when we don't live with him personally, for the most of our lives, there must be something to equalize that lack of his presence, sallallahu alayhi wa And he did indeed clear that out before he left. He said, I'm leaving, and as I leave, I shall leave behind something for you that if you live with, not if you just parrot its letters. If you live with, if you live by, if you sense 
you shall experience the same miraculous life my companions have experienced. And that is the Book of Allah. And the men of my household, the men of knowledge, for the men of knowledge are the true men of the household of the Prophet So I'm leaving you basically as I go, the word of Allah, the seed of which I have planted today, and the tree will grow, and it will be so miraculous that as time passes by, and the farther you get from the wonderful, splendid times of the presence of the Prophet on earth, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the tree will become so wondrous and miraculous that it will compensate for the lack of him living amongst us today. But you need a key to that tree. You need a key to seeing the miracles of the tree. And that is the men of the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this important event is showing the Sahaba that this is the teacher. He's come to show you and teach you your religion and this is the way the transmission of knowledge takes place. But the question about the last age should make us all raise our eyebrows because what does that have to do with the three other questions? Now, a poor, uh, an attempt from the poor slave here says that in the last age, the way forward, the way for escaping the trials and tribulation is to go back to the sunnah way of receiving knowledge from teacher to student to student and so on, and to journey through the mountains of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. So you must aim to go to the mountain of Ihsan, not just accept to be on Islam and Iman. It's not enough. In those times of the last age, which he had given us clear signs in, in the, in the hadith, he asked him when, and he says, I don't know when, but I will tell you the signs. I will tell you, the ones that are listening to the words of our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that when these signs appear, you need to adopt that method of education, and you need to embark on a journey to the peak of Ihsan. For the, that is the only way you will be able to stay safe. Now the other thing is, the different narrations start one time by Iman and one time by Islam. And in that, I think also there is a message for us. But they all end up with the questioning around Ihsan. So let's journey together. Imagine, imagine yourselves going onto a journey through the mountains and you have two mountains that are in front of you and behind those two mountains there is a passage to another peak. The first mountain is called the mountain of Islam, the other one is called the mountain of Iman. It's okay, you can approach the mountain of Islam through the mountain of Iman. And you can approach the mountain of Iman through the mountain of Islam. And we see that all the time. But you can never approach the peak of Ihsan. Excellence. Ihsan is excellence. You cannot approach that without completing your journey through the two peaks. It will not even appear. The passage will not appear until you complete the journey through the two. The two legs, the two legs, the leg of Islam and the leg of Ihsan, and the Iman, will lead you to that. And this answers the question, because you live here, 
with a lot of um, fellow non-Muslims. When you go to work and you find someone who has faith, who believes that there is a day at the end, there is a God, there are books, there are messages, you have to be befriend that person and you have to come near them. For he may be higher on the mountain of his Iman than you are on your mountain of Islam. And it, it's actually very easy to get somebody who is at the peak of Iman, which is much taller than Islam, to jump over to Islam. But the other way around is very difficult. Somebody who knows the law and who thinks he has perfected his deen, I pray, I give my zakah, alhamdulillah, I don't commit any sins, does not find a necessity. I'm not saying they think it is not important, but they don't find an urgency to embark on a trip or a journey to climb up the mountain of Iman. This is very important, which means that we need to consider where we are on those two big mountains. The mountain of Islam is very relatively simple to understand the instructions on it. And tashhad an la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. To bear witness, take the shahada, bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa To pray, to fast, to give the zakah, perform hajj if you can. Those are all physical activities. Shahada, tongue, salah, zakah, fasting. And it's a matter of technicalities. You can go to a jurist or a faqih. And he will tell you, depending on which madhab he may be, or you may be, and he will tell you, this, these are the different little differences between one school of ju jurisprudence or fiqh and the other. And you can pray, and you can fast, and you can make your wudu and everything. So you can go to a teacher and say, teach me Islam. And, there, and he can give you a curriculum and we see those curriculums in all our mosques, in the brochures, in the flyers, in the summer school for the children. We see that very clear, how to teach the kids to pray, how to teach them how to make wudu, and then, mashallah, excellent efforts are being put in that field. Okay, now, I'd like to go to the teacher and say to him, can you teach me how to be a believer? I'd like to climb the mountain of Iman. Drawing a blank. Is your Iman in the angels solid? Or is it just a thought that's flying in your brain? Where is the teacher or the scholar that you can go and sit with and ask him, teach me how to believe in the angels. Not tell me a story about the angels and their names and their functions. I need to believe in them. They are unseen. Teach me how to believe in the previous messengers. Not tell me their stories. I need to have faith in the prophethood of Musa and of Isa and Dawood and Sulaiman. I need to have faith in their prophethood. Give me that faith. I need to have faith that there is Yawm al Qiyamah. Teach me. I'd like to learn how to have faith. Can you show me a book? Can I read a book? Is there a brochure that teaches people how to be believers, mu'min? No. Is there a course? that you can take after which you will be a mu'min? No, there aren't any courses. There aren't 
such material. And this is something critical. Because <laughs> Islam without Iman can lead to hypocrisy. And Iman is something hidden. And how can a teacher teach you something hidden? Let alone how can we know that the teacher has Iman to start with? It's not by the amount of books that they know or they have memorized or the verses or if they are Hafiz. So a Hafiz does not mean he's a mu'min. As in having the arkan of Iman. He could be. Alhamdulillah. How are we going to approach that with our children? I'm sure all of you are very, very, very cautious about teaching them Islam. But we need to teach them Iman now. This is a question that I leave open for you. The second point is the sequence of faith and the sequence and the organization of Islam. The foundation of the mountain of Islam is Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And the peak of that mountain is pilgrimage. What does that mean? It means without the shahada, you cannot reach the next step. And it means that the top part of your practice, if you will, is to return back to Allah. Pilgrimage is the return to Allah. So you pray, you fast, you've done this, and now the top practice, if you are able, is to go back to Allah. Which is basically to go back to Allah while you are still alive. Meaning to die before you die. Because you're going to Allah, wrapped in white cloth and having nothing from this dunya. This peak has a much higher peak corresponding to it in the mountain of Iman, faith. And that is to believe in the decree and destiny. The highest point in anyone's faith is to believe in decree and destiny. To believe in the qadr, khayr, wa sharr. Wa sharr. Wa sharr, not just its khayr. Yani nobody can reach that level without having had already perfected his belief in Allah and in the angels and in Judgment Day and in the books. Everything, you perfected that. So if you have a, an, a, an issue in the faith, in decree and destiny, we have to go back and examine those layers with somebody who can teach us faith or better transmit faith for Islam can be technically taught and faith can only be transmitted. You have to transmit it. There is a transmission. You have to be almost beamed with Iman to get it in your heart. Something has to come into your heart. We don't know how to get it. That's the open question I want to leave you with, to think about and see how important it is for you so that you can make a decision if possible today or tomorrow or whenever, that I'm going to make a change. I'm going to become a, mus a mu'min now. I'm going to find out where can I go to become a true believer and not just a practitioner. The peak of the belief in the decree and destiny comes after one has journeyed through the faith in the angels, which means he knows the angels. The angels know him. He knows how to interact with them. He knows the protocol of, the, of talking to the angels. And they know him very well. He knows his angels, because every one of us has his own set of angels that surround him. 
protect him or protect her, go out with him or her, take care of many things for them. And this is in the hadith and in the Quran for those who are searching for the dalil, obviously. So it is very important that you go through that. The angels, the books, the messengers, to have faith in Yawm al Qiyamah, Judgment Day, Al Yawm al Akhir, and then reach the peak of Iman. Because of our time tonight, I would like to say that once you've completed those, another peak, another mountain, a passage will appear to the mountain of excellence. Now, only those who have passed the two can embark on that trip. So we have to first be honest, look inside, where are we? And as soon as we find that passage to that mountain of Ihsan, the mountain of Ihsan, the Prophet وسلم, says in the hadith, and to worship Allah as if you are seeing Him. And when you or if you do not see Him, He sees you. Now let's explain that. The meaning of this is to worship Allah as if He sees you. What if He doesn't see you? To worship Allah as if you see him and if he if you don't see him to worship him as if he sees you <clears throat> so in both cases you have to embark on an act <coughs> of worship that is based on witnessing on seeing your examiner or knowing that your examiner is seeing you. One of the two. And as you journey the, the life, and when, when we say worship, it means everything in life. It just doesn't mean the acts of worship. It means you are in school, you are at home, you are traveling. To be in one of those two states, a state of being watched, or a state of seeing and watching. <clears throat> How are you going to see Allah? The peak of that mountain of excellence, by the way, is unattainable in this life. But it is attainable, inshallah, in the life after. Which means, unlike the mountain of Iman, the mountain of Islam, where you could see the peak and you could work hard to get there in the mountain of Islam, or work hard with your teacher to get there in the mountain of Iman. In the mountain of Ihsan, the maximum you could reach is deep desire to see Allah and hence depart to go and meet Him. So the best day becomes the day when you are leaving to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that is the point at which you reach that peak, physically reach the peak. So you're going to embark on that journey of, of climbing the mountain of excellence, knowing that the journey must be continued by going through death. And that answers this question of fear of death. You have been for two, three, 10, 20, 50 years <clears throat> living as if he sees you and he, you see him. Now you want to actually see him. So you're willing to take that painful injection at one point to go out and now really be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the first bounty and fruit of understanding this beautiful hadith, that death now becomes a vehicle to drop you off at your beloved, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather than a painful experience that could lead to fear, anger, and a lot more of the uh, unexpected events that come along with death. 
Now, <clears throat> as we start to think and reflect a little bit more on the mountain of Ihsan, the mountain of excellence, worshipping Allah as if we see Him, and if He doesn't see us, if we, if, he, if we don't see Him, He sees us. What is it that we need to start getting through on that mountain and moving forward? We must complete the first two, Islam and Iman. And as we start to move into that journey of witnessing, it's a journey of living with the unseen. All of the journey of Ihsan or excellence is living with the unseen. Seeing what others don't see. Experiencing what others don't experience. When everybody says, let's go to this side, you think like, no, I'm not going there. Why? Because I don't think I should go there. When everybody says, let's do this, you may not be doing it. When everybody is not seeing, you are seeing something different. You are now at a level that is different in your dealings with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that journey, as you start to climb that mountain of excellence, Allah will give you different gear, including different set of eyes, different hands, different feet. He actually says in another hadith, I shall be his hands, his eyes, his feet. And when he calls me, I am next to him. I shall fulfill his request right away. And I will protect him, a different, different human being. And many people ask the questions of what should I do in a situation of so and so? I ask, which area are you in? Are you in Islam or Iman? Have you completed this or that? Because the answer to your question depends on the amount of knowledge you have. And more importantly, the climbing, act of climbing up that mountain is referred to in multiple verses in the Quran. And actually it's referred to as the primary function of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given a blessing to the believers by sending them a messenger from amongst them to recite his verses, to give them light. That's number one function. Number two, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ يُزَكِّيهِمْ is translated sometimes as يطهرهم, يعني, to purify them. It's not. Tezkiyah comes from being elevated. So he shall elevate them level by level. That's the function of the divinely guided prophet and his inheritors, the teachers. To elevate, to bring them to a higher, new height, new excellence. So maybe before, when you were in the mountain of Islam or Iman, you were a generous man. Now you're going to get to the excellence of generosity. Maybe you were a kind man, you're going to get to the excellence of kindness. Maybe you were a patient man, you will be practicing the excellence of patience. You're going to get into a very elite group. And you are never going to get there by yourself because before you embark that passage, the first thing that you have to go through if you want to take that journey is a big self detector. You know the metal detectors you go through in airports? There's a self detector at that passage. And if you have any traces of yourself still inside you, it will beep. They won't let you. They'll tell you, go back. You need to go back. You have not completed the course before. 
Only the ones that are like the water of our wudu, colorless, odorless, beautiful, and tasteless. It's pure water that you just go through, that will go through that to embark on that climb. The climb to the peak of excellence, of Ihsan. Why do we need that today? And this is what I want to leave you with. Why do we need it today? Because today, my respected brothers and sisters, we are witnessing an unprecedented attack on our hearts by the tyranny of the mind. The human mind and the logic is just taking levels that have never been seen before. And it is attacking everyone's heart, every man, every woman, every child. And the attack is getting more and more vigorous as we become more and more immersed in today's modernity. Today's modernity that leads to a lot of misery and unhappiness. Today's modernity that, that leads to us not living any moment because we're either sitting in the moment before or the moment after. On a phone, on an email, on a chat, on a message, recording a moment that took place before or planning a moment that will come after. But the now is not available. It's not on the map. It is not part of our daily acts to be now. And as that advances, a lot of the coming generation is going to drop the whole climb because they're getting used to things coming to them easily. Things must be easy. Because you hear a lot of the children nowadays, and actually not the children, I've heard young men, with every two words they they use the word fun. This is not fun, or this is a lot of fun. So everything has to be based on the fact of fun. And you know what? Climbing mountains is a tough job. Not virtually climbing mountains on a video game, but physically climbing mountains. It needs somebody to be fit and strong. And it needs somebody with stamina and strong intention to be able to climb. And as the other life, the lowerly life we are in, gets easier and easier and more beautiful and more simple for them, you know what? We don't want to go there. This is too much. This means that one has to consider, has to consider that the life you lived, the life your parents lived, is not going to be the life that the children are living today. And they need something more than technical terms. They need to see, they need to feel a touch of wonder, a touch of miracles. They must see it, they must experience it. They need the father and the mother to show them that with that path, they can be special children, special young men and women that will not live like everybody else. They will live differently because they will see when others don't see. They will be saved when others are not saved. And when they see that with their own eyes, they will believe. They will believe. It is exactly like if somebody tells you that a certain disease is not curable. And all the literature and the articles say that if somebody gets this disease, he or she will die. And the doctors write a report that says this person has this disease and they have no time left. If that person, if the young man, if the young boy or girl sees the blessings and the barakah of the man or the woman 
who is with Allah on the path of excellence, who can drink and take a sip of water and give it to somebody who is sick. And that person drinks from that bottle and becomes cured against all odds. Trust me, this person, this boy, this girl, this young man or woman will not have any thing that can shake his or her faith because he's seen it. It's finished. That's it. I need to see with my own eyes. I don't need technical lectures. I need to see with my own eyes. If he or she one time as a young boy in their dreams saw the Prophet وسلم, who appeared to them and said, you are one of my people or you are my son or daughter. Finished. It doesn't matter what the world of science is going to tell them about dreams or I've seen it. And we need to cultivate that culture of excellence amongst the children, amongst our families. We cannot just accept to climb those two mountains of Iman and Islam. We must be determined that we will take it one step further and we will climb up the mountain of excellence, Ihsan, so that we can weather the storms we are seeing right now in the last age that we live in today. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and bless your families, bless the ones that you love, with a path that takes you from just saying to acting, and from saying and acting to feeling, and from feeling to actually being, because that is what will change others. It is good to feel, and to feel you are on the right track, but what we need are people that are there to be, that can impact lives around them by their presence, not by their speech, not by what they say, just their sitting in a place brings the barakah and the khayr, brings the rain to the, to, to, to the land and makes everybody's problem solved. Their presence is the solution. They don't speak of a solution. They are the solution. They don't speak of the path. They are the path. If you see them as the Prophet وسلم, when asked about awliya Allah, how do we know awliya Allah, Ya, ya Rasulullah? He says, these are the men that when seen, Allah is remembered. Direct. When you see them, you remember Allah. Because they are with Allah. And is there anything that can survive being present with Allah? No. If you put anything with Allah, it becomes zero, annihilated. And only the face of Allah remains. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذو الجلال والإكرام وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وغفر الله لي ولكم وجزاكم الله عنا خير الجزاء والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته If there are. So we have uh, at least 20 minutes or so. If anybody would like to ask any questions, it might be a good opportunity. Sure. Assalamu alaikum. So you mentioned that the turning point for somebody is to see or feel for them to have a man. And so what was your personal experience for you to like see and actually believe? Usually um, for somebody who's leading a, and I will speak generally, uh, and that will probably uh, help you understand. Somebody who's leading a set life nowadays, 
everything is sort of in place. He's praying five times. He's going to the mosque. He's going to school. He's uh, you know, as a family. Or... After a little while, you get set in your ways, and you sort of get comfortable in what you're doing. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this blessings for you to be called to that path, He sends you one of two. Either He sends you a, an experience that is usually emotionally very deep, sometimes very painful. And from observation, this usually takes place as a person starts to approach the age of 40. More or less. Or he sends you a man. If you're one of those people that received a man, you are blessed because the pain of the experience that will make you shaken is usually very, very severe. But you will be thankful after that if that led to you waking up. Because when you wake up, you will realize that that was the best thing that ever happened to you. Had you continued to be in where you were, nothing. And I've seen different experiences from different people lost all their life savings. People had a tragic loss of a son or a daughter, or people had a severe betrayal in their lives or an accident that disabled them. I've seen different things that are painful. And sometimes it is joyful as well, a transformational you know, metaphysical experience that, and I've seen also people who's gone through that. But at the end of the day, when that experience comes to you towards the age of 40, and you are a follower of the Prophet Muhammad it is that horrifying experience that the Prophet had when he was in Hira at the age of 40, when he was shaken to the core. And that led to the beginning of the revelation. The beginning of the revelation. Now life became different. There is now a purpose. You know. So my, um, my humble opinion is that be patient and know that wherever you were, good or bad, it is what brought you here, so it must be good. So do not regret, and be careful when you deal with the angels. When you deal with the angels, there is a way to talk in front of them. Showing signs of dismay, or I'm not happy, or complaining, or whining all the time. Be it about your situation, about global situation, about anything. Angels don't like to hear that talk. Because whatever the situation you are in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of. So who are you complaining about exactly? And they don't like, they, they, they don't have the patience that Allah has with His people. They don't like to hear the servants that they saw at once them filling earth with killing and with corruption, as they said, also being disgruntled and upset with Allah's destiny. They don't like that. And as they leave you, you become more and more left to yourself. You don't want to be with yourself because yourself will continue to trap you with more and more uh, tricks and will throw more and more veils in front of you so you don't see it. This is very important. Because it will give you the veils of my responsibility, my family, the community, the work for Allah. It, it, the self is very, very smart. <inaudible> and it will keep giving you these veils to prevent you from going to your hira, where you will see the truth about the self. And will keep you busy. So you come back from work, may keep you busy with, I'm working for Sabilillah, I'm doing this and that and the other. 
but the heart is really in a very bad condition. Uh, I hope this answers the question. Thank you. Assalamu um, You spoke about um, like Iman and how it's like kind of like getting beamed into your hearts. We just don't. I mean, it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you also talked about, um, you know, with our kids encouraging, I don't know, that transformation. And I was just wondering if you can speak a little bit more about what we can do as parents to kind of help that beaming process or kind of at least encourage it. The beaming process, first of all, the, the beaming process, everything comes from Allah. You know, there, there, is, there is a misconception that certain things come from Allah and others don't come from Allah. No. Everything comes from Allah. La ilaha illallah. We are not schizophrenic religious people with multitudes of parallel lives. Me at work, me in the mosque, me with the good things, me with the bad things. And it doesn't work like this. You the Tawheed, the, the meaning of Tawheed, which unfortunately is not being addressed properly now. Tawheed means to bring things together, to unify things, to unify your life in the mosque and unify your life at the workplace. You know what that means? It means your workplace is your mosque. And your mosque is your workplace. It means your workplace is the mosque. And the mosque is the workplace. This is Tawheed. And, and Tawheed also means unification of the source. So everything comes from Allah. But Allah has ordained in His wisdom protocols and methods for things to be transferred and transmitted. For example, when Allah in his divine wisdom wanted to rescue Musa السلام, he gave the mother of Musa السلام, instructions to go through steps and then put the newly born in a cot and put the cot in the river. He could have been beamed from Allah and he's saved. No. And Allah has ordained in his book that the way he will bring people to him is through man. This fact was understood by our father Ibrahim السلام, when he said, Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasulan. He didn't say, O oh Allah, guide them and beam them with Iman. He said, Allah, send them a man. Because he knew the divine protocol for transmission of his mercy. You see, that precedes Ibrahim alayhi salam. That goes back to the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained in his own wisdom and in his divine wisdom. It is my decision to place a deputy on earth. That's what I will do. And many Muslims fall in the trap of the, the non-Muslim understanding of the Garden of Eden, saying it was the eating from the tree was the cause to be thrown out of heaven. This is not the Muslim view. We believe that the, the, the departure from the Garden of Eden, from the Garden, and the, the descent to earth was not to humiliate mankind. It was to honor him. Because Allah had decreed that. Read Surah Al-Baqarah. Before he created Adam, he said, Inni ja'alum fil ard, in earth, Khalifa. And when they ate from the tree, he said, now you go to earth. So he knows they're going to earth. 
And he dis- decreed that. And it's his protocol to send a man. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ followed the protocol. The minute he taught his people, he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen. He sent this one to this. Sent a man. Sent men. And the same way you could reflect that on your children. The children need to be connected to a circle of a blessed man. Somebody has to be in your lives who's not a technical writer. Somebody has to have a blessed hand who can put his hands on your children and read Fatiha and there will be angels protecting them because of that man's presence. Somebody has to show you how to read the Ruqya you tried 100 times and it didn't work. Somebody's got to show us how it works. Because we all read it, downloaded it from the internet, read it on our children, in our homes, and yet have not seen the impact and the effect of that. Somebody's got to come and show us how does that work, actually. Because it depends on the person, and it does not depend on the text itself. So my answer, short answer, is which orbit do you or your family rotate in? Where are you? Where is your, how are you, how are you rotating? On what? And if there isn't that pivotal gravitational pull, you will be like meteors flying off into the space and crashing and clashing. Earth is rotating around the sun and the sun is rotating around the galaxy and the galaxy is rotating around the universe. It is Allah's laws of mechanics, of movement for that eternal pilgrimage which you do around the Kaaba to reflect on your... Why do you go seven times around the Kaaba? Why are we rotating? Why are we going around and around around the Kaaba? Because Allah is telling you, where is your Qibla in your life? Who are you rotating around? And please, if you say to me, I am going around the Prophet ﷺ. Of course all Muslims are going around the Prophet ﷺ. But the Prophet has said, this is the way you come to me. And I don't think any of us can claim knowledge superior to his. And it is simple. As the Prophet ﷺ departed from our, our world, he said, I'm going to leave a specific way to get to me. If you want to have a fundraising, and I was talking to my brother here about this earlier, and there will be a million people participating in that fundraising. How do you do it? Everybody knows you. Do you send them an email and they all come out of their homes walking? There'll be a stampede. They'll kill one another. But you will say to the people who live in Fremont, you're going to go to so-and-so's house and then you'll come out from there. And the people who live in Haywood, you're going to do this. And then, then you're going to say, these two, you will meet this man at this point. And then you will all converge and I shall meet you at that point. The Prophet actually, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, described that process specifically. And he shall, said, I shall be waiting for you at the how at Kawthar. Come with the people that I have sent to you. Everybody comes with his, with his leader and the leaders come together and you converge and I shall meet you there. This is the way, the divine way of how this is being through. So how do you, how do you get that across your child? You have to expose him to that divine radiation. You have to find a radiator, source, a generator, source. You need a source. What good is a, um, a fridge or a television that has no electricity in the wire? We need the generator that puts the electricity through, not the material that plays on the TV. 
and, and, and we, we have been collecting a lot of dead items. Where is the life? Where is the teacher? Where is the teacher? The Prophet ﷺ was not doing sessions for the Sahaba every day. He was not doing seminars and workshops. He was going with them to the marketplace. They were eating, drinking, traveling, laughing, crying together. But he was a, he was a massive generator of divine guidance to the degree that we see that in how many of the Sahaba accepted Islam. Umar ibn Khattab comes to him and in one of the narrations about how he became Muslim, he comes and he enters and then the Sahaba says, who's this? This is Umar. He must be coming to, to, to do some damage. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, let him, let him come in. And as he comes in, he stands up and he holds him and pulls him towards him and says, isn't it time for you, Umar? And he falls to his knees. He says, Ashhadu an la ilaha wa Muhammad Rasulullah. What did he do? How many talks? How many books did he give him? None. But his chest, alayhi salatu wasalam, was full of that. And if any of you has met any of these people, you know that their chests are vibrating with a metaphysical power that permeates through steel. Not through human beings' hearts, without them talking, just sitting in their vicinity, changes you. That's why we had people migrating from their countries and leaving their homes to go and find somebody like this and stay with them, taking all their families, and all their belongings and go to stay next to somebody like that. That's what the Sahaba did. And this deen will only come back the same way it was erected in the first place. And that means two things, hijra wa suhba. And I keep saying that all the time. Hijra wa suhba, migration, companionship. Those two, migration was compulsory, was obligatory for Muslims to go through. Where is my hijra today? And where is my suhba? And if I don't have the two, it's very difficult to change. Especially the more and more we advance into the sedentary, relaxed lifestyle. And we entrench ourselves deeper and deeper, having anchors right, left and center, unable to make a move. We, we, I, I meet people that, are, that want, that they don't know what to do. Where do we go? How do we do it? And the answer is, if they're so sincere, Allah will send it right to their doorsteps. Wallah, and I've seen it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send us the key holders. Yes, my brother. Yes. young man and uh, somehow he, he's gonna stay in the state of Islam he can perform but he it does not come to him because his mind is not developed is this is this what I sense from you like it has to be like no like it, you, l l very good question yeah. on the ages of man the 20s the 30s the 40s the 50s the 60s so to understand that, again, the sunnah is to look at the life of our Prophet He lived for 63 years. So we will count up to the 60s. The age, the first 20 years of life are the age of ignorance in a way. Bliss, still mind is growing. The next 10 years, the, the 20s is what I, what I personally define as the age of the words. Words, as in a word. That age, every young man in the 20s is chasing words, very glamorous words, right, left, and center. A new word comes out, new definition, let's go after it. And there are lots of words in this world. As he or she crosses, and women tend to mature earlier, as he or she crosses into the 30s, it becomes the age of meanings. 
So he discovers that in his 30s that so many words that he was foolishly chasing in his 20s have one meaning. So the meanings get less now. So he starts to focus if they get, if, they, if he or she gets married, he starts to focus on letting let me take care of the family and then all of it becomes reduced into five, six, eight, ten meanings in their lives and they're rotating around those ten meanings throughout, every day, at work, in the mosque, everywhere. So it's much less now. The funnel is getting less. So they chase the meanings. As you hit the 40, there's a wall and it has a door and the door can only open from the other side. Because from 40, it becomes the age of the truths about the meanings. And the truths don't come from your conclusion. Anything you conclude about the truth is a hypothesis. Somebody has to open the door from the other side, pull you through and tell you, do you know all these meanings you've been chasing? They have one truth behind them, and that is and puts it in your ears. After that, the age of 50 to 60 is the age of wisdom, where you start to realize, in general, that all the truths, in fact, are one truth. And from 60 onwards, the age of departure, where you're ready to go to that truth, al-haqq subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, there is nothing beyond that truth except the dalal and the batil. There is nothing beyond that. It's bottom. So this is the journey from the plethora of words to less meanings, to less truths, to the truth, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the destination. This is where everybody's going. Now, some people continue to live the, in the ignorance, extended or, uh, you know, shortened. But it doesn't mean that a person in his 20s or his 30s cannot realize that. It means that the age of 40, for the majority of people, is the deadline. It is the deadline. This is the age at which Imam al-Ghazali discovered his journey and started embarked on a 10-year journey. The age of so many. Read. Read and learn about so many of those people, you'll find that it happened at the age of 30, sometimes 35, uh, 40, 35, around that. But it's a deadline. For the majority, I have seen people crossing into the 50, personally, that I know. They arrived at the 50, but what I noticed is nobody who's crossed the 40 did not get a massive wake-up call at that age. I, I'm sure of that. Some of them didn't wake up, and Allah gave them a second chance later on, but at 40, it was a massive trial that they went through of some sort. And everybody that I, I ask, I find that it happened. And remember, we're counting years in the lunar calendar, not in the, not in the Gregorian calendar. So 33 years of lunar, uh, Gregorian equals 34, actually. At the end, one more year extra. I hope this answers the question. Yes. Sorry for that. I apologize. Alaikum salam, my sister. This might be harder for me, so. Bismillah. Bismillah. I can hear. Okay. Um, growing up as a Muslim in America. Um, being someone who's not afraid to admit that even as Muslims, we feel like we can't talk to fellow Muslims. And I think that's very sad sometimes. And um, I don't mind to admit, because it, it might help someone else, that I struggled with my own education, the career, the job, the looking the part, because I feel like I'm first generation Muslim American, and our parents, they're doing the best they can. I forgive them too. I hope only Allah forgive us all. 
but we've been making to feel like we're having to chase the dunya more than our Islam. And if we struggle in life stuff, we're made to feel like we're not worthy. I know that, may Allah help me and forgive me my own wrongs, but I guess I just wanted you to maybe to touch on that or that I've seen a lot of broken hearts of people, Muslim and non-Muslim in this country. And even in developed worlds, we're losing our minds because we, or people are losing their minds or their hearts because they feel like we're just being judged. But I realize it shouldn't matter what other people think of me. I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to speak up because I used to be very withdrawn and very scared to talk to people because there's a lot of brokenness in people. But may Allah help us remember our deen, inshallah. Thank you. Jazakallah khair, may Allah help you and us. I like to take a little bit of a different approach to this. And uh, it may be a little bit different from what you've heard from others. And it doesn't mean that they are wrong, but this is not the way my teachers actually uh, uh, told me it should be. We do not have such thing as my Islam and my dunya. Again, I will repeat that. Your dunya is Islam and Islam is your dunya. And the day you will be able to reconcile that, every atom in your being will fall into place. The problem is that we've been educated otherwise. There is one hour for Allah, one hour for myself, one hour for my family. That's the, not the path of excellence. The path of excellence is that the hours are all for Allah, by Allah, from Allah, and back to Allah, with Allah. This is the path of excellence, which if you manage to reconcile all that struggle inside you and all those unanswered questions about why are you here, and why haven't you gotten this chance, or why this didn't take place, or, 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 will all be answered very, very, very easily. Because they will all fall in place, because they will all, be, all the questions you will have will become one question, and it will have one answer, and that is to get to know Allah. Do you know Allah? Or do you know about Allah? Do you know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Or is it that you know about him? That's a very important question. If you do not know Allah, if you do not know Sayyidina Rasulullah, go find somebody who knows them, kiss their hands, beg them to introduce you to Allah. Because if you depart from this life without knowing Allah, it will be the biggest loss of your efforts and times and everything else. You are here in what is a difficult situation because He wants you to be here now. You're, he, want, he gave you that chance to be successful in your career. Because Allah wants to see you happy. This is another piece of news. He didn't create all of this for you to be sad, to be self-torturing. Allah says, That type of extremism was never ordained by me upon them. Instead, Allah wants to see you and me very happy. And when he sees you crying, and when he sees you sad, he send, sends you more angels to tell you, please, can you see my hand behind everything that you're going through? And the day you see the hands of Allah behind everything that happens to you, whatever it is, and the day you see that Allah is the one who acts through your friends and your enemies, equally, and that they have no power of their own, and they have no control of their own, that day you shall come back
to your originator and you will be settled and you will not have that pain anymore because you will realize Allah sent me to be here now. He sent other people to other countries. He sent me to do this job and I know him. I see his hand and I feel his, his angels touch in every morning that I wake up. And the first thing that I wake up instead of chasing to my phone or the little booklet to read the awrad that the Sheikh said I must read is I find myself spontaneously saying Alhamdulillah for this morning. What a good day. Alhamdulillah. That is the point that you need to get to. And that has one answer. There's only one master key. I can give you a lot of technical questions, correct little answers to tell you do this in the career. Do, but I will say what my teachers used to tell me. If anybody points you to answers to your questions, they are lying to you. And if they point you to Allah, they are truthful to you. And so the answer, the call that my teacher's father used to say is, come back to Allah, not to yourself. Come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you come back to Allah, you will find settlement. You will no longer be chasing things. Things will be chasing you. You will no longer be running in circles around things. Things will be running in circles all around you. If you go to a land of drought, the rain will fall. If you meet somebody sad, he will be happy. If you touch somebody sick, he will be cured. Because you speak by him, you act by him, you drink by him, you eat by him. Everything you do is by him, from him, to him, with him, in him. That is the answer to all these questions. The career, the dunya, the children. And that can only be done through getting through the gateway of Allah. And by the way, one last point. A lot of people see the creation, and what I mean by creation, the people around you, your families, your jobs, everything, they see them as a barrier between them and getting to Allah. They have a lot of uh, human beings, the responsibilities, everything, barriers between them and Allah. Yes, we always say, and that's what we've been taught, creation, indeed, creation, indeed, is a veil. We say, al-khalq, Hijab al-haqq. They are a veil between you and the truth. But we also say, and al-khalq bab al-haqq. They are also the doorway to the truth. Indeed, if you look at any door, it is a barrier and a veil. But it is the only way you can get to the other side. So the, 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 instead of saying, oh, this door, it's stopping me from going to the other side, just find the key and that door itself. So once you get to know Allah, nothing will change in your life. It's the same career, same family, same life, same everything, but you'll start seeing everything differently. And the same things that were standing between you and your beloved subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the same things that will deliver you to Him. The same trials you went through that you thought were done because you were sinful and you did mistakes, you will thank Him, you say, Alhamdulillah, you put me through this trial that brought me to you. And the Prophet wasallam, in the hardest of his trials coming back from Taif, his prayer was, if you're not upset, I am happy. If you are not upset with me, I am content. And he gets the confirmation immediately. Of course we're not upset. We see what happens to you. And if you wish, we can annihilate these people for your sake. And the Prophet immediately وسلم, says, no, no, no. I was just making sure that you're happy with me. If you're with me, no problem. Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and the Prophet وسلم, together in the Ghar and they're sitting, Abu Bakr Siddiq is looking and the, uh, the people of Quraysh right there and he says, Ya Rasulullah, they, they, if they look, they will see us. The Prophet وسلم, is seeing a different scene. As I said, the path of excellence, you see things differently. 
He says to me, Abu Bakr, what do you think about a couple who, who Allah is the third companion of which? Basically, he's telling Sayyidina Abu Bakr, if you are with Allah, you are unseen because you are under his veil. They will not see you. And it happened to him in another incident where he was not seen. Basically, what we are saying here, my dear sister, all the keys can be reduced to one key. And all the paths need to be reduced to one path. And don't think that you have your Islam and your career. There is no such thing as that differentiation. And your family and your responsibility and your this. The Prophet ﷺ says, when you know Allah, everything you do become pleasurable and rewardable. The Sahaba says, so if somebody is with his wife, he gets reward for a reward for that? Yes, of course. He says, yes, of course. This is ibadah. Why do you say Bismillah before you eat? Because Why do you say Bismillah when you enter your house? Bismillah is not just uttering the name of Allah. It's saying, I am entering my house with Allah. I'm with Allah. I am eating with Allah. He is with you wherever you are. Are you with him? Because he is. And he doesn't change subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are the ones who keep reminding ourselves by saying Bismillah, by saying Alhamdulillah, by remembering Allah, because we are the forgetful, but He does not forget, ever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all present in His companionship and protection and under His love and, and under His vision all the time so that we know Him and see Him in our actions, in our words, all the time. And we see everything he gives us as being a blessing and khair, alhamdulillah, what he gave us is very good. And we see our lives and our work and our da'wah and our efforts to help others as all one thing. And that is our life, to see our lives and our deen as one. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us do that. Jazakumullah khairin wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله هيا على السلام هيا على السلام هيا على الفلاح هيا على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استقيموا واعتدلوا رحمكم الله الله أكبر
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين لقد أرسلنا رسلنا بالبينات وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس بالقسط وأنزلنا الحديد فيه 